I've made the case for imperfect photography many times in the past. I have a few videos like this one that you can watch there. Today we're going to talk about how we can make our photography more imperfect. When I say imperfect, I mean technically imperfect. When it comes to photography as an art, clean, sharp, properly exposed, in focus images are not necessarily the best way to convey a message, a feeling. In fact, pictures with a lot of grain, some motion blur, deep dark shadows, blown out highlights can make for photographs full of uh, mystery, drama. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why film has gained so much popularity over the last few years, along with uh, Polaroids or even Digicams lately. Because one could argue that cameras are just too good nowadays. They capture reality too well. The thing is that photography is not always about recreating every single detail on a face or on a place, but about recreating what we felt when we saw, when we experienced, when we witnessed that magical moment or when we were in the presence of that person. Also, you already know that I like images that ask questions instead of revealing the answers. We do this by leaving enough room for the imagination to fill those gaps. So let's talk about the ways we have to achieve this, both in camera, in the field, like filters, lenses, and shooting techniques, and in post-processing, of course. Because as usual, there are pros and cons of doing it in camera versus in post. That's why I do a little bit of both. When we do it in camera, the results look more natural, more organic. The downside is the commitment. We commit to an effect in the field and that is going to be baked in in the image forever. It's going to be very hard to change if uh, not impossible. In contrast, post-processing gives us a lot of flexibility. We can tailor the effect to the specific image because one photograph might call for a stronger effect and another photograph might call for a weaker effect. We can play with this in post. We can experiment without distraction. The con, of course, is that we can't go too far in post or it will look pretty fake. Even if this last point was going to fade away to, to be irrelevant in the future because technology keeps progressing, especially with AI, even if we were able to create on the computer whatever we want to create with just a couple of clicks, I think that a more balanced approach will still be the best way to go because we as photographers, as artists, we have no replacement for being out there in front of those magical conditions because it is out there when we feel what we want to create. At the same time, by embracing a little bit of post-processing, we can make our lives a little bit less frustrating because we can tweak them a little bit, just a little bit, to get there, to, to create what we saw, what we felt in the field. You know, it is very ironic that technology has progressed so much and that we spend so much money on the, the best tools for the job. And then we go out and we buy filters that actually decrease the resolution, decrease the sharpness of our gear. Like this filter that I have here, this is a glimmer glass. This is just one of the many kinds of filters out there for this purpose. They are diffusion filters like soft focus, mist filters, and glimmer glass filters. The problem with these filters, the reason why I don't use them in my photography that much, is that there are way too many of them. As I said earlier, some photographs will call for a stronger effect and some photographs will call for a weaker effect. For example, this one is a glimmer glass rated at one, which is somewhere in the middle. It's not too strong, it's not too weak. And that is exactly the way I feel about this filter. Another option, a cheaper one, I like cheaper options, is to use a UV filter and put some grease or maybe some water in front of it. There are some special lenses out there that create beautiful effects. Think of lens based baby lenses, for example. I've never used one of them. I've never tried one of them. I really want to. I've really wanted to for a long time, but I'm afraid that I'm not going to use it very much because, again, they are very opinionated lenses. The effect is baked in the image. There is no way back from there. That is the case with the this lens that I have here. This is a pinhole Holga plastic lens. It's able to create beautifully imperfect images, but again, they are 
pinhole images. If that's the way you want to go, that's totally fine. But for me, sometimes a pinhole image is the way, and sometimes it's not. So even though I do like this lens, and I do like some of the results I've gotten in the past, it's rarely my camera bag, because it's only for very, very specific and special cases. I prefer to go with more, way more subtle effects here. And for that, manual lenses are a much better option. Nowadays, all the manual lenses that you can find out there are either old, from back from the film era, like this uh, Konica Minolta 40mm 1.8 lens that I have here, or they are modern, cheap uh, lenses, for the most part. So they are not the sharpest tools out there. That fact alone is going to make for some more imperfect photography, but also because it's a manual lens, you have to manually focus, it is inevitable that at some point you're going to miss focus, and that might create some accidental great images. There are more things that we can do in camera to create more imperfect images, like long exposures, because no matter how steady your tripod is, if you are doing a very long exposure, that is going to inevitably add some vibration to the image. It's not going to be as sharp as it would be if you were to shoot it to shoot it at 1 500th of a second, for example. It's also going to create all sorts of effects uh, in the image, like blurring out the, uh, the clouds, smoothing out the water, and stuff like that. I love long exposures, and if you want to go, if you want to step it up in the imperfection scale, you can always use welding glass, as I talk in this video right here. Another technique is ICM, or Intentional Camera Movement. I have a video from the woods of Portland from a few years ago right here that you can watch. That was really fun. But what I do on a daily basis in camera is, one, to shoot wide open, no matter which camera and lens, I am using, and to shoot in low light and bad weather conditions. Again, I have a video where I make the case for shooting wide open, right here, but basically lenses are softer when we shoot them at the maximum aperture, which makes the photographs less perfect. And of course, the lack of light and the bad weather conditions, because it creates that beautiful, mysterious uh, atmosphere. I have a video about shooting in bad weather here as well, if you want to watch that. But basically, it comes down to the same concepts, because when we shoot in foggy weather, when we shoot in rainy weather, when there are clouds running in and running out, when we shoot at night, all of those elements hide parts of the landscape, hide parts of the background, hide parts of the subject, and it's revealing different compositions that leave room for the viewer's imagination. Another way to achieve this is to shoot through glass uh, when it's raining outside. I really like that because some parts of the frame are going to be in focus with a lot of detail and some parts are not. So for the most part, shooting wide open and in bad weather is going to take me where I want to be in my uh, photography. If I don't have that beautiful light that happens on rainy days, cloudy days, foggy days, I will use faster and prime lenses, because by using that shallow depth of field, I can achieve a little bit of the same effect, you know, of making just some parts of the frame very clear and some parts of the frame not clear at all. And as I said, whatever I do, I try to keep it subtle, so I have enough room in post to play with the images in post. I usually have a very good idea of what I want to create in the field, but sometimes when I sit down in front of the computer, when I'm more relaxed, when I have more time to think, that could be years down the road. Well, sometimes I change my mind and I see images that I didn't see there. The same way that we get better every time we go out and, and, and take photos, we get better at finding compositions and finding uh, new subjects. When we edit, when we do more post-processing, this applies as well to the analog darkroom, we get better at those things. So something that we might not be able to achieve, some techniques, some editing, post-processing techniques that we are not even able to think about right now, we might be able to do them two, three years from now. So that's why I think it's very important to, to give us margin of error and flexibility for the future ourselves. I do believe that the post-processing part of our workflow can be as important as what we do in the field. And it can be as creative and sometimes even more of what we do in the field. Let's talk about it. So even though this is pretty obvious in my work, I think it's still worth pointing out that the biggest thing that I do to make to create a gap between reality and my photography is by far 
shooting in black and white. That's a pretty big layer of abstraction to place on top of the real world because there are no colors and our brains are used to the color. It's, they are very helpful when it comes to, you know, to interpret what, what we are seeing. But without them, without that information, when we are looking at a monochrome image, our brains have to work slightly harder to make, it, uh, to make their own interpretation of what, of what they are looking at. Sometimes that is very subtle, like in this example where the fog is the one creating the atmosphere, not so much the color, but in other cases it is more pronounced. Like this photo with the American flag, and without the colors, we have to think slightly more about what is that we are looking at. Take this image as another example. It's pretty clear that we are looking at water and sand underwater, but when we convert it to black and white, that is not so clear. Besides black and white, there are a few more things that I do in post-processing to make my images more imperfect. We're going to start in no particular order from uh, with this uh, light uh, tap this light section here in Lightroom. What I usually do is I either take the shadows way down or the blacks way down because I want to have deep dark shadows with no details. But as you can see here in the curves, the point is not to have pure black values in the image, but to have the lack of detail. I actually don't like to have pure black, so that's why I raise the curve a little bit here, so I don't have those black black tones, and the same with the highlights. I don't want pure white uh, in my images, but I still want the highlights to be a little bit blown out without details. Now we have to go much farther down to find the next things I do uh, with my photographs. This is just a specific example for this image, but this is something I do in most of my photographs. Like I usually add a lot of grain, especially when there are a lot of dark parts in the frame or bright parts because they have no information, no details. The grain adds a little bit of texture to that part of the, the, the image. And also adding grain, especially when we increase the size of that grain, that decreases the detail, the sharpness of the image. And I quite like that. In the same way, I add just the tiniest amount of haze into the image. Again, I fine tune this depending on the image, but that is a, a good foundation where to start. I also add some vignetting to focus the attention on the subject that is usually in the middle of the frame. If not, I will play with some masks to do the to achieve the same effect, but just not in the in the center. Talking about masking, I want to show you a couple of examples where I use gradients to remove more detail to create that mystery that, I, that I've been uh, talking about. This is a good example. This is a road in the, in the mountains. And I'll show you the original one. This is the one. So as you can see, there is plenty of details of trees uh, here along the road. So what I saw when I was there was not all the leaves, all the branches and all the trees there. I saw the road isolated in, in a mountain with all the fog. And that's what I tried to recreate here. And to do that, I created a mask where I selected just the lines of the road. I kept those untouched while I was tweaking the rest of the frame. So I was able to take all those shadows and blacks down. So as you can see, there is almost no details on the trees anymore. You can still make uh, that this is a mountain, a mountain road, but you, all your attention is focused on the road, the fog, and it, it disappears in the distance. So it makes you think about where this road is coming from, where it's going to, and you don't get, let's say, distracted by other details that even though they might be beautiful, they are not what I'm trying to convey here in this image. And that is pretty much all I do to keep my photography imperfect because cameras today are just too good and they capture way too much. The camera is going to record everything that was there. And I think that our goal as photographers, as artists, is to capture that first feeling that we had, not necessarily what was there. I hope this all made sense. I hope you learned a little bit more about my process. I would love to know about you, though. I would love to know if you make your photography imperfect in any ways as well. If you use special lenses, filters, if you do something special in camera or whatever you do in post processing or the darkroom. So please share your thoughts and what you think about this in general in the comments down below. And that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.